Hello, Hello welcome, welcome back, back to, to Refractions. Refractions. Sorry, Sorry for the, for the uh, brief, brief delay, delay, but I'm extremely, I'm extremely excited, excited that we have, that we have photographer, photographer Mark, Mark Peterson, Peterson joining, us, joining today. us today. Hello. Thank you. Mark, thank you so much for being here. If you if can, you can uh, uh, just, just tell, tell me a little me bit, a little like bit. what brought you to photography? Um. I, I was about 25 and I had failed at everything else. So I thought I would uh, try photography. I thought it was going to be easy, uh, which was my first mistake in photography. Um, but I, I was in Minneapolis and uh, where I grew up and I started uh, I wanted to be a writer, and I was not very good at it. Um, so, but I was working for small neighborhood newspapers, and to, um, uh, you know, do the articles, I would take pictures. So I kind of came to photography that way. And then, and then, was there, was there a a one, One assignment, assignment that kind of launched, launched you onto the, onto the national, national stage? stage. Um, when I came to New York, um, I did get an assignment from Kathy Ryan at the New York Times Magazine. And it was to photograph Brooke Astor, who was the head of New York Society. And uh, coming from Minnesota, it was a world that I had no idea about. Um, I got in her chauffeur driven car and she's wearing full couture with uh, gloves up to her elbow and jewelry, you know, that was probably worth 40 or $50,000. And I rode around with her for a few days and, and got to see her world. And uh, luckily enough, that story was a cover story and uh, the images were uh, lively and colorful, and people noticed it. So your, so your first, first assignment, assignment with the New York Times, Times magazine, magazine ended, ended up a cover, cover story, story with, with the, the Kathy Ryan. Kathy Ryan. Um, I had done one before that, which was an even harder assignment. Where, um, But yeah, this was kind of the first big assignment I got from them. Nicely done. Nicely done. Where, how Where, did Kathy, how did find, Kathy you? find you? Um, she had seen my work at Visa in, in France. Um, I was with an agency, JB Pictures, uh, some, you know, really incredible photographers like Maggie Stieber, Ken Light were there, Mark Asnan, um, you know, Scott Thody, uh, and we had a show and, you know, she saw some of that work. So. Three degrees, Three degrees separation. separation. Yeah. <laughs> you've, you've been, been in, in some, some pretty, pretty high, high energy, energy intense, intense locations, locations and, and events, events lately. lately. Can you, can you, Talk, Talk us through, through a little, little bit about how, how you approach walking into like, into like any of the political, political gun, gun environments, environments that you've been, that you've been in. in. Um, you know, a lot of what I want to do uh, when I go as a photographer, I want to look at um, the scene so that other people can see it how I'm I'm seeing it and that. Um, you know, I'm not a, a war photographer or conflict photographer by any means. Um, I, you know, I'm I'm a political photographer, an editorial photographer. So it, this country right now um, it, is going through a transition, and there's a lot of disagreement on both sides about. Uh, which direction the country should go in. So I'm just kind of following that river, following that that vein of tension. And some people are calling it a cold civil war. 
Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of times I'm following uh, different groups that have emerged and trying to show, uh, you know, what their role is in, in the political scene at that time. The images, the images for, me, for are me are pretty, pretty graphic. graphic. I mean, I find, I them, find incredibly, them incredibly, you know, you know compelling, compelling and sometimes, and sometimes you know, frightening. frightening. And, and how, are those, how are those subjects, subjects responding, responding when they see the photographs? Are they like, yeah, that's yeah, exactly that's how like I wanted to, want to look? Or like, what are they, what do they, they say to you? Um, I, I haven't gotten a lot of response necessarily from some of the groups I've, I've photographed. Um, uh, you know why I'm making the graphic images I make? Um, because I want people to feel that chaos, to feel that tension, um, to, uh, you know, to, to feel it. A lot of times, you know, when I started my project political theater, a lot of the the way I tried to look at it was, you know, imitating some of the the shadowing, the depth of field that was in Citizen Kane. And, you know, there's actually a moment where Foster uh, runs for governor, uh, Foster Kane, and, you know, just the montage and the Dutch angles and, you know, just like I, I are burned into my memory. And so uh, I try, I've tried to use that kind of feeling, you know, the, the tension that's in that and, and the drive for power, whether it's somebody sitting in the audience, listening to a, a politician speak, or it's somebody marching in the street you know, all of these people now are starting to break, you know, what I would say is the fourth wall. In the past, people were, uh, you know, it was the politicians who were on the stage and they were the ones directing, you know, the action and telling people what to do. But now the people in the audience have leaped out of the audience onto the stage and they're creating so much of the tension and the drama, whether it's a militia, whether it's Proud Boys, you know, whether it's MAGA, you know, I was just in an event um, in Texas last weekend, which, you know, was, you know, this attempt to go to the border and take back the border with a convoy of cars but it was it was much more of a of a political theater than it was a real thing, you know. And so to try and show that, to show that dynamic, I mean, it, if you were to say, oh, there are only a thousand people at that, you could say, oh, that's not, you know, what does that really matter? Why highlight this? But if you look at the coverage it got. In, on the right, in in the internet, you know, millions and millions of people followed it every day. So there's this echo effect that goes out. That's interesting. That's interesting. So interesting. even though, so it, even was though it was a small, small attendance, attendance from the, from the headcount, 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 but because, but of, because, the, because of the the reach, the, reach, the, the, event, the still event still had a great, had impact, a great impact to the to people that are people that are following, following kind of following supporting, supporting that that that, um, that um, is, it, is a convoy, is it convoy vehicles vehicles yeah convoy yeah it was a take our border back convoy and obviously somebody put up a lot of money to help support it and the rally and stuff but yeah the reach was all you know the the bloggers and the influencers and and the people streaming everything like you know the the front row at at every stage or at every rally that was held was just you know people streaming it and just getting hundreds of thousands of views of what was you know, you could say a thousand people 
sitting, you know, across from the Rio Grande River, you know. So that's that's what I'm kind of saying about people breaking the fourth wall now. You know, it's not just somebody like Trump or Biden, you know, on stage anymore. The people who are, you know, the bloggers, the streamers have taken over that role in many ways. So they don't have to rely rely on the traditional traditional press press to come to them to to follow this. this. They They can just just kind of create create their... their yeah, the own yeah, content, content that way. That way. Is, that what you're saying? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. They're, <laughs> they're as, as influential as anybody else at this point. What did, what I, did, didn't, I didn't know what you know meant what about, you the, about fourth the fourth wall. wall. Um, the, you know, my first book uh, was called Political Theater, and, and I was looking very much at how... Um, the stage was crafting the image of the politicians and, and they would take on these personifications. And, and I was always trying to dramatize that. Like the cover of the book is just Chris Christie's mouth and that. And, and to me, that symbolizes him. What, you know, he used the power of his, his, you know, yelling at people like in town halls, he'd just start yelling at a a school teacher, you know, like that. So I wanted to, to look at what his power was. And I tried to do that with other politicians in that book, you know, look for that dynamic feature that shows them like Ted Cruz, I photographed from low and you know, there's a shadow up above him. But, you know, I wanted to make him look like a preacher, which is much of what his, you know, um, speeches are like. You know, he he kind of goes through it and you almost are waiting for the choir to start singing at the end, you know, as he brings you to the conclusion. Um, but uh, so... Another theater term is called the fourth wall. So that's the wall that's in between the stage and the audience. So um, what I'm saying is, or what, what to me appears to be happening a lot is the people who in the past have sat in the audience and just applauded and listen to the politicians now are stepping out of the audience and they're on the stage, whether, I mean, like Proud Boys, you know, or Militia, or, you know, these bloggers or streamers, they're the ones standing on stage now telling you what is happening instead of a politician. It's really, it's really interesting, interesting how you phrase, how you phrase this, this as a, as a performance. Because once, once you put the, put the lens, lens on watching this, this it, they become characters, characters and you're, and you're documenting, documenting this, this, you know, theatrical, yeah, theatrical performance, performance is really, is really, I can see can why see it could be, could be appealing, appealing in a way. In a way. Um, yeah, I mean, how I started political theater um, was... I went to the Capitol. It was during the Affordable Care Act um, vote. And the, um, I forget what group, but it was a Republican group had set up a stage right below the Capitol. And all these senators and Congress people came out and they gave their soundbite so that it would get back to their constituency back in their home state, they gave, you know, their little moment, you know, 30 seconds or a minute, you know, to get on TV and say it. And then they walk back in the Capitol and that, and, and I photographed that, that was in 2013 and that, and, and when I looked at the pictures, it didn't show 
that how staged the event was, that the event was totally staged for TV and to get these sound bites out you know, to the voters and that, that, that there was no real reality to it and that there wasn't a discussion about the Affordable Care Act. There wasn't an uh, idea about what it would bring to people or not bring to people. It was all about being on stage and saying that soundbite. So after that, I I started, you know, looking at apps in the iPhone and, you know, I, I started putting my pictures that I had taken into my phone. I spent probably four or five dollars on the really expensive apps and that and and I just started looking for the I didn't want to make the pictures fake but I wanted to make them more stand out that you could, that you would start to see that the theatrics of it. And so that's how that all kind of started was, you know, I really wanted to, to show the, you know, that, that so much of it was a soundbite. And then later they go back and they're having lunch with the person they just demonized or whatever you know, like that. So is that how the work is? Sorry, just to jump in. in. Um, um, we think the audio issue is coming, is coming from, from your side, Mark, the audio, the audio feedback, feedback, because, because if you want to either, either get, headphones, get headphones, headphones, headphones or you can you mute can yourself, yourself and, and unmute, unmute when you're, when you're talking, and talking and not talking. Okay, I'll do that. I'll mute it. Okay. Okay. I still got a little bit of a delay, but at least we're losing the uh, echo. Oh, yeah. Mark, that might have been it. That was the one. Uh... <laughs> now we know. Um, so we were just uh, talking a little, and that kind of, I guess, gets into one of my questions about the uh, the editing and post-process. So you're you're shooting, and you must be generating, you know, massive amounts of images on these projects, right? Like it's just a ton of images. What's the the edit like for you? Like how how do you how do you get through the images and how much time does it take for you to digest all of that? Um yeah, I I kind of go blood simple when I photograph. Um so yeah, I take a lot of images. Um you know, yeah, it can take hours um, for me to go through everything. And and I used to do, like I said, I started doing it in an iPhone, you know, like with an app. But then now I do everything in Photoshop, you know, the toning and stuff like that, converting it to black and white. Um, so, yeah, it takes... Um, if I shoot all day, it can take me four or five hours then afterwards to edit or a full day at times, you know. It's still pretty, it's still quick. pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, uh, in in today's world, you don't get a chance to to come back and look at stuff two weeks later and say, you know, uh, now I'm going to, you know, deal with it or edit it. Um, a lot of times the people I'm working for, um, I'm very lucky uh, that I'm working with the New York Times opinion page a lot. Sarah Barrett there, um, who's great. Um, and that can be a turnaround you know, w within hours of something ending. Yeah, that's tough. There's not, like you said, if it's hours, you know, you've got to get back into the car, the hotel or whatever, download and just send it off. And so how, how tight of an edit would you typically send? Like, does I guess it depends a little bit on the, on the publication, but like how, you know, how much, 
how many options do would you typically give your clients? Like how how restrictive are you with with what you send? Um, well, I'm an egomaniac, so I kind of think all my pictures are gems or iconic or uh, so I send way too much. I'm sure every editor has a story uh, complaining about having to go through one of my takes. So it, it's hard to say a number, but, uh, you know, I, I tend to send way more than I should. I think they might like that because then they at least know that they've got the whole you know, spectrum of everything that happened. They're never going to have to, you know, email and say, Hey, do you have any more? They're like, no, he just, he, he sent us plenty. <laughs> so like, so what, like, kind, of what kind of direction are you getting from the, the editors? I mean, I feel like you've got a pretty distinct and, you know, noticeable style and aesthetic, which I love. I love just the graphic aspect of it. It was really great that you brought up some of the classic black and white films. I just immediately made me think of uh, Dr. Strangelove. And some of the <laughs> um, when they give you an assignment, you know, if they're saying we need you to go photograph, you know, this rally on abortion rights, is that it or are they giving you further instructions from there? Um, first of all, Dr. Strangelove, such a great reference. And especially in our time right now, um, you know, with, you know, the crazy double speak we're getting, you know, if, if anybody wants to try and, and understand our times, that might be a good movie to start with or 1984 or whatever. So, um, but yeah, editors, um, I, I'm very lucky to have editors that, that want to give me direction and want to, you know, help me understand what I'm going to look at. Cause, cause they, a lot of times they've already researched stuff, you know, and, and they're already, you know, they know what's going on there more than I might, you know, just coming into something or getting the first call about something. So I, I always appreciate any, anything, uh, editor can, can, enlighten me with or direct me towards the thing um that as a photographer and a, and i suggest this to everybody it, is whenever you get an assignment you know and you get that direction follow that direction but then take pictures for yourself or take pictures that that you are discovering that that no, nobody thought about you didn't or the editor, you know, that you're finding along the way. Don't lock into just one thing, you know. I think that's a great piece of advice. I I find it really I, I am very tunnel visioned. I have a hard time multitasking uh, sometimes even on just like personal shoots. I've just like if I've already decided that I am this is what I am focusing on. I don't react, I think, sometimes. And it's 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 a really good piece of advice that I need to listen to. So thank you. <laughs> um are they do they send writers with you? Are are you accompanied by people at all or are you pretty much on your own? Um I would say 90% of the time when I'm working for a magazine, um the writer has already finished the story or, or it's, it's in revision at that point. And I'm just kind of following the trail the writer had done or, you know, um, illustrating some of the scenes the writer has seen. Um, so yeah, the vast majority of the time I'm, I'm working alone. I mean, in these situations, there's of course, uh, you know, tons of journalists um, and photographers. So it's not like you're alone, but but I'm not working usually hand in hand with a uh, writer. And and when you're out, like, what are you doing to 
stay safe? Like, are they, you know, are the crowds, you know, feeling threatened at all about all the cameras or are they act reacting like, you know, the, the celebrities that they are in their head that they, they want to be captured and photographed to, for the performance? Um, uh, yeah, sometimes it's, it's not safe, you know, and, but it's just kind of my job to, to do, you know, what I do in those situations, whether it was, you know, January 6th or, you know, other events like that. Um, you know, it's just kind of my job. I mean, it, you know, it's really sad. You know, a lot of a lot of journalists and photographers were hurt that day. And that the disinformation now about that or that it was just a friendly crowd that it wasn't any difference from people on tour. Um, it, it, it's sad. Um, I, you know, as I said, I'm not a war photographer or conflict photographer. Um, you know, I, I always try and be safe and, and, you know, like that. But, uh, you know, there are people that right now really want to hurt the press, you know, and really are out to, to, you know, in certain situations, they've really hurt the press and, you know. So just in case some some listeners don't know, can you just, and I don't know all the details, but can you talk a little bit about your experience on January 6th? Um, so yeah, January 6th, um, I was uh, working for the New York Times. Um, I had been in D.C. Uh, for, um, I think, five days already, six days, uh, maybe even longer. And I was working on a story about the new Congress coming in. So I was, I was trying to show that transition and all of that. And... He, you know, I covered the rallies, the two big rallies that were before January 6th. And so I knew the potential for violence. I had seen the violence. You know, both of those rallies ended up, you know, people going through the streets, just beating up random people. Hundreds of proud boys going through the streets doing stuff. So you could imagine at some point that day there'd be violence. Um, so I, uh, the thing I was trying to do that day um, was make a picture that would show Trump and the White House and the rally and that. So I went early to the ellipse where that rally was. Um, where Trump said, you know, we're going to, I'm going to march with you or what, whatever his exact words were. And I, I went up high cause I knew at some point his face would be on these three different TV screens and it would look like big brother talking to the crowd with the white house. So that's, that's kind of, you know, the only image I had in my mind I was trying to go to. And so then um, while he was speaking, I left because I wanted to get to the Capitol and get, you know, there's a ceremony where they carry the boxes, uh, you know, the state certificates of election through the congressional hall. And I wanted to get that moment. And, you know, so I got into the Capitol right before it happened. And so I'm inside, I take some pictures and they start the discussion. And of course there were the objections. So the Congress, you know, broke for the debates about it. 
And I'm just sitting there kind of waiting for uh, the next moment to happen. And suddenly a police officer comes running. I'm just sitting there. <laughs> and come running in and says, go to your office, lock the door. The Capitol's on lockdown. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, you know, it, it, it was, uh, I don't have an office in the Capitol. So... <laughs> So uh, I don't mean to laugh or be jovial, but so I went to the window and I see the whole inauguration stand engulfed with people, you know, and Trump flags and MAGA flags. And I'm like, I got to get outside, you know. So I tried to get outside and, you know, the police wouldn't let me out because the, the Capitol was on lockdown. So I'm just sitting there like kind of going, you know, nuts, wanting to get outside. And maybe within, a, you know, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, I hear this pounding, just really loud pounding the floor down. And I go down and there is the first breach. And Officer Goodman is standing there trying to hold back you know, these 20 or 30 insurrectionists who are coming in, the guy with the Confederate flag, the shaman, you know, QAnon shaman guy, the guy with the Q, all of that stuff. And so I just followed him and, you know, the day just kind of evolved from there, you know. And I, I mostly stayed in the Capitol and just followed different groups. Um at one point, I I felt like I had to get outside to make a picture of the mass of people around the Capitol. So I forced my way out one door and went out and did that. And then I kind of worked my way back in, forced my way back in a door. Um, or not forced is maybe the wrong word, but it was so crowded and tight. You had to kind of push your way to get through, you know, the opening. And so then I went back in and I, I just was there, you know. It's terrifying. I've, I've seen, you know, some of the images and everything. And I just, we have to, we've, I've never spoken to you about it. So thank you for sharing that. Um, it's, you know, this moment in history that is under incredibly hot debate right now about, you know, Oh, it's just a grunt, you know, group of tourists. Like, relax, get over it. Um, <clears throat> Can I just say one thing? Please, please. Uh, to me, that was one of the most important days for journalism in this country because I'm not saying my work, but all the people, there's so many important pictures that were taken that day and so many important videos that were taken that day. And it, it, it's so hard to deny what really happened. And, uh, you know, like I said before, people were hurt and beat up, you know, that day. You journalists were really hurt. But the strength of the journalism that day and reporting was, you know, we haven't maybe seen something that documented since, you know, 9-11 like that, you know, and the power of journalism coming through that it did. I think it's really valid to make the comparison to 9-11 just from a political scope, except for the fact that this was internal this is domestic terrorism rather than international but we you know we were attacked by this mob and you know it's under debate about what that you know means legally as we speak and it's it is going to change you know this country's history i think how um how things get decided and i mean you're you're you are in this role of documenting along with the other journalists that you mentioned, but I think it's just, it is so important, the work that you're doing right now. And it's, you know, I'm just, I'm really thankful for it. I th I'm very, you know, intrigued by your aesthetic and point of view about how it's being captured. And, 
yeah, I just, I applaud you and I applaud the work. So thank you, Mark. Thank you so much for taking the time and the effort and the work because it's, it's something else. Uh, well, you're too kind. And, and I, I really want to emphasize that I, I feel like this is the time that, that so many people are doing such important work, you know, and documenting this period. And, and, uh, you know, it, it's important to not, you know, let what's happening be denied later on. You know, I think uh, we've seen that in history, whether it was during the Vietnam War, whether it was World War II, whatever, that the that the pictures that people remember help us understand that part of history. Very much so. You mentioned that uh, the image of Trump up on the multiple screens and everything, that, that was a shot that you kind of had in mind. Like, do you have like a, a storyboard or a shot list when you go into these scenes of what you're looking to capture along with, you know, everything that you get in between, but like how much pre-visualization can you do with, you know, with scenes like that where it's just, it's evolving so quickly? Um, I, I'm not big on pre-visualizing. I'm just not, when I try and I'm really good at chaos and things that are moving and suddenly it all makes sense. But when I try and create a shot, I, I, it just looks stale or, or staged or whatever. I mean, not create, but when I'm trying to put a bunch of elements together that, that don't just, you know, flow or whatever. Um, but for that, uh, you know, it was, it was cause of this long-term assignment I was working on. I knew I needed a shot that would capture Trump and what was going on in the country at that moment. So, so that's why I was, you know, going after that picture to try and and show his power over this crowd and you know in the end that that's why you know 10 or 15,000 people marched to the capitol because of what he told them to do at that moment it's, yeah. I'm going to keep my mouth quiet on this <laughs> um And uh, you talked a little bit about uh, the book that you had in 2016. Um, how many books have you done so far? <laughs> There's one. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I did a book with Powerhouse called Acts of Charity, which, you know, uh, started from what I mentioned about following Brooke Astor. And, and so I did, you know, the charity scene in New York for a number of years. And, and so that book came out, the writer, uh, Phil Weiss, uh, wrote the text. He's a great writer. So then in, in 2016, I did a book with, uh, Steitel, uh, Gerhard Steitel is incredible. I'm very lucky. And that was uh, political theater. And John Heilman, the great political writer, wrote the text for that. And now, hopefully this year, uh, Steitel will put out, um, uh, basically it's going to be three books, uh, but they're reprinting political theater. And then the second one is called White Noise, and Claudia Rankin, the great writer, uh, wrote the text for that. And the third one is called The Fourth Wall, and she wrote the text for that, too. And I'll be in a sleeve uh, that'll be titled The Past is Never Dead. So, uh, fingers crossed, <laughs> that will happen. So... Uh, 
I guess in answer to your, uh, sorry for the promotion there, but in answer to your question, uh, I've, I've published two books so far. With a slip cover coming out with three encased in it this year. So congratulations. Looking, looking forward to, to see that. Um, so where can everyone see your work? Sorry, I'm very lucky to be with uh, Redux Pictures and Marcel Saba. I've been with him since uh, the 90s. Uh, and I, I'm just really lucky to be with the agency. And so that's the place my work goes, my library and stuff. And then also uh, Steitel, you know, it's, has political theater, I think, still. Um, so th those are the best places. And you're in a couple, you're in a couple of, museum, of museum collections, collections right? right? Um, yeah, I, I've had a couple, you know, being collected. Yes. So, um, yeah. Well, well, congratulations. Thank you so much for the time. Um, is there anything else you would like to share that I didn't talk that about? Talk about? Well, I want to thank you for giving me this audience. I really appreciate it. I have great respect for you and yeah. what you do. And you've been very diligent to keep asking me. Uh, I, you know, I, I, you know, thank you. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. You were, uh, you had very justifiable reasons on why you had to, you know, cancel because it was like, you know, a week long cover story for, you know, certain publications and you were flying out. And so uh, uh, it's all right. I'm glad the timing worked out now that there was a, a brief moment in, in calm your schedule and also in the world. So, uh, Mark, thank you again for being here. Thank you, B&H, for hosting. For hosting. Uh, I hope that the, the audio glitches didn't uh, get too bad for the audience. And uh We'll see everybody back here in a uh, couple of weeks when uh, Sig Harvey is going to be uh, joining us at the end of the month. So thank you all. We'll see you soon.